star of our show, Mr. Charlie Williams. A coloured comedian from Britain, Charlie Williams, entertains a white nightclub audience in Salisbury, Rhodesia. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say how pleased I am to be in Rhodesia. Now, this is a wonderful country. I like it. I hope you like it. <laughs> and if I have any borrow from your lot, I'll take it back. <laughs> No, I'm only kidding, I'm only kidding. No, you can have it. I mean, I've only come over here just to get a tan on. A black Briton trading racial jokes with white Rhodesians. For people who mightn't want a black at their table, it's a nice irony. This, as the manager will tell you, is a multi-racial club. Except for Africans. Oh, you were born here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is that in colour? <laughs> I hope it is. If it's in black and white, you've got a negative. <laughs> In Salisbury Cecil Square, black bandsmen play for the whites as they celebrate their occupation of Rhodesia at the annual Pioneer Day ceremony. It's 85 years since Europeans colonised this black African territory they called Rhodesia after their imperialist patron, Cecil Rhodes. Today, a tiny white population about the size of Newcastle governs six million Africans. They no more share power now than they did at the turn of the century. Most whites came to Rhodesia only recently, but they hastened to adopt the simple colonialist values of the pioneer men of the land, who still dominate Rhodesian politics. We are gathered here before you today to commemorate with thanksgiving the pioneers of our country. These are the men and the women who've lived the entire course of Rhodesia's short history, the last survivors of the original pioneers. The task you set before us is no less a high adventure than was theirs, calling for nothing less than our total commitment. At the side of his Prime Minister stands trooper Barry Borden. For him, this is a proud moment. The grandson of a pioneer He's been chosen to perform the main ceremony of the day, to raise the flag. Eighty-five years ago. Um. White Rhodesians have never been prepared to take orders from their kith and kin in Britain. In rebel Rhodesia today, the Union Jack flies only to one of the pioneers. Traditions have a rather romantic view of the pioneers who rode out from South Africa in 1890. Gallant fellows, ambitious to paint Africa a British red. But theirs was no civilising mission on behalf of Britain. Rather, it was a commercial venture to exploit the country's mineral wealth. The pioneers were after gold. They were followed by ox teams hauling supplies the pioneers needed to make their foray into Central Africa a permanent settlement. The pioneers finally halted at what they named Fort Salisbury and before they dispersed to look for gold they raised the British flag. Today the Union Jack flies in Rhodesia only once a year. I used to have a young student in the RLI ring, pulling up the flag today. Yes, that's not that's not very appropriate to have one of our youngsters had to come back from the valley to do it. The ceremonial uniform put aside, Trooper Barry Borden is back on patrol along Rhodesia's troubled border with Mozambique. White Rhodesia got away with UDI because it had its own army, and now it confronts not Britain, but black nationalism. For over four years now, Rhodesians have been fighting guerrillas who come across from Zambia or Mozambique.
Rhodesia is now calling up every white man under 38 in the effort to hold the line against the black insurgents. Barry Borden was a volunteer at 16, on active service while still officially underage. Why is he fighting this war? Well, I feel it's to do something for my country and keep it white, you know, fight the terrorism so we can have a decent country. I've lived here all my life. Well, this is what I'm fighting for. Yeah. I'm not going to let somebody take it away from me. My folks, you know, came when this country was first thought of. Now I intend carrying it on, make sure they stay at home. Noah Kowo starts work at about half past five in the morning. He says he doesn't really like driving taxis and at the moment he's looking around for a better job. He used to drive a car for a Scotch whisky salesman, a job he says he enjoyed immensely. But he still reckons he's lucky when he compares himself with a lot of blacks in Salisbury. Some of them have no job at all. Noah doesn't own the taxi he drives. He gets paid a commission by the company, which amounts to a wage of about $35 a week. That's in a good week. His white coat comes free, and he says the company canteen serves a good lunch at a reasonable price. This is Noah's home in one of Salisbury's black suburbs. He rents it from the local council, which charges rent on a sliding scale depending on the tenant's income. Noah's rent is seven dollars a week. <laughs> Noah's living room measures approximately 20 feet by nine and if the front door is kept permanently closed there's room for a sofa, two chairs, a sideboard and a radio. Noah has four children whose ages range from one to six. There's one bedroom for them and another bedroom for Noah and his wife. There's also a kitchen of unbelievably cramped proportions. This is the lifestyle of the average working class black family in Salisbury. And Noah is better off than most. His next door neighbour earns $12 a week working in a clothing factory. In this part of Salisbury, living conditions are somewhat more luxurious. Here, the living rooms are built on a grander scale, and there's a bedroom each for the children. These are the homes of the white families in Salisbury, and it's not hard to find areas where the houses are even grander and the gardens even bigger. On average, the head of the household here would earn over $200 a week. This isn't a white ghetto. There are plenty of blacks who live here too, but they don't own the houses. They do the gardening and the household chores, and on average, they earn about $30 a month, plus free board and lodging. These are the simple economic facts of life in Rhodesia. Noah Kowo is aware of the big difference in living standards between whites and blacks in Rhodesia. He cares about politics and has a cousin who lives in exile in Zambia working for one of the black nationalist movements. Noah says the time has come for black majority rule in his country and that the Rhodesian government is heading for trouble if it refuses to make concessions. But at the same time, he readily admits that if the white men pulled out of Rhodesia tomorrow, the black men would be economically the worst for their departure. Noah lives in one of Salisbury's better black suburbs. All the houses in this area have electricity and running water, but there are some black suburbs in Salisbury where the electricity is supplied only to illuminate street lights. Despite what appears to be a Spartan existence, the blacks in Rhodesia enjoy a better standard of living than in most other countries in Africa. All the children here attend modern local schools, 
and there's an efficient and cheap system of medical care which means that no black need ever go without proper medical attention. Although they don't live here, there are black millionaires in Salisbury, African businessmen who've made their fortunes without hindrance from the Rhodesian government. But the fact remains that there's a massive difference in living standards between blacks and whites, and at the moment there are no plans for that gap to be bridged. In a country of six million blacks, only 9,000 are on the electoral rolls. Rhodesia's blacks elect 16 members of parliament. The whites elect 50. This country has been ruled by a minority white community for 85 years. Now, 85 years is a very long time. And uh, uh, when we say majority rule now, we mean that the majority of the people, the people as a whole, not excluding white people, all the people together, must have a constitution that gives them the right to choose the government they want, together, as a people, not just as black people. Joshua Nkomo is now negotiating with Prime Minister Ian Smith as the unofficial leader of Rhodesia's black nationalists. And Como spent 11 years in prison for his political activities. And it's a significant sign of change in Rhodesia that he's now a free man and fighting harder than ever for black majority rule. If you don't get what you want, if you don't get black majority rule as soon as possible, would you yourself consider taking up arms, leading an armed struggle against the white government here? What I've said is that the armed struggle is on now. It has been on for the last 10 years, and we have been involved in one way or another, so the position will not change. With respect, sir, my question was to you. Would you consider leading an armed struggle or taking up arms? The position is this, that I'm a leader of an organization, and that organization has been taking part in the armed struggle. So that you understand, don't you? Do you have sympathy with them at all? Do you think armed sympathy? struggle is the only... Sympathy with who? I mean, they are my men. How, how can I have no sympathy with the people who, who are members of my organization? While Joshua and Como speaks freely of his support for armed struggle to win black majority rule, the Rhodesian government is stretched to the limit to prevent it. 90 minutes drive north of Salisbury, this village is surrounded by a barbed wire fence and every person coming in or going out must produce an identity card and be searched before they're allowed through the gate. It's what the Rhodesians call a protected village, and by that they mean protected against armed supporters of the black nationalist movements. Rhodesia's border with Mozambique is about a hundred miles north of here and it's estimated that across that border are 6,000 armed guerrillas. Their arms are supplied by China and it's from their bases in newly independent Mozambique that they make their raids into this area, laying landmines, attacking Rhodesian soldiers and attempting to politicize the local black population. The arrangements here are a clear measure of how determined the Rhodesian government is to stamp out guerrilla attacks by the black nationalist movement. The 1,500 or so people who live in this protected village have been moved here from their old homes in villages and kraals which were dotted around this area and where they were easy prey for armed attacks by guerrillas who resorted to some pretty dreadful means sometimes to get food and moral support. So far, the Rhodesians are winning the guerrilla war, but at an increasing cost, not only in terms of their own casualties, but in terms of men and material to keep villages like this one secure. It's the black Africans who are the losers in this situation. Forced to live in barbed wire enclaves, they still risk contact with the guerrillas, who, despite the stringent security measures, have on occasions infiltrated the protected villages. They've been known to cut off the mouth, ears and fingertips of men who refuse to support them and force their wives to eat the severed flesh. 
And as if that wasn't enough, the Rhodesian security forces have used some pretty tough methods themselves with anyone they suspect of harbouring or supporting guerrilla fighters. It's the sad history of Africa's so-called wars of liberation that the victims are more often than not the very people who are supposed to be being liberated. At the centre of decisions about Rhodesia's political future is Prime Minister Ian Smith. He once said that he wouldn't see black majority rule in Rhodesia in his lifetime. Is that a prediction he still stands by? I still hope so. I believe that we, were, we would have failed in everything we had tried to do if we had to concede that that sort of thing should take place. In other words, government which depends on the colour of a man's skin, irrespective of his ability. I could never accept that in principle. I think we must continue to strive for the best government in Rhodesia irrespective of colour. And uh, this is the system in Rhodesia. It is possible for anybody, whatever his colour, to come in and participate. We want the best government, not necessarily a black government, not necessarily a white government. That part, sir, about being able to participate, though, is not certainly true as far as voting is concerned, is it? Oh, yes, country? it is. The voting is exactly the same for the black man as for the white man. The black man has the same opportunities as the white man. The black man can come into Parliament, as can the white man. There is nothing in this country to prevent a black man sitting in my chair, providing he has the ability, providing he can earn the position. But this so, is I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the franchise is not that wide, is it, to allow every black man to vote? No, it isn't that wide to allow every white man to vote either. We simply have a standard, you see. And, and I wonder if it isn't a good thing when you see what is happening in the world today, how standards have dropped and how irresponsible governments can be. We have always had the standard, I would remind you, going right back to the beginning of our history, in the days when the British government was implicated. And if it was right then, I wonder why it is wrong now. The standard is, if I can put words in your mouth and forgive me for doing so, that there are certain people in this country who don't have the necessary level of sophistication or education to be allowed to vote. That is correct. And as I say, it applies to you whatever your colour. Now that is seen by many people in the outside world as racist. Do you consider yourself a racist? No, I certainly don't. In fact, I live so close to the problem of racialism with so many black people around me that I think I'm conscious of the need to ensure that I'm not a racist. And as a pragmatic person, I can assure you that I am not a racist. It would be impossible for me to go on living in this country, I believe, and to play the part I'm playing if I was a racialist. All that we say is, let's have some standards of decency and behaviour and civilisation and whatever your colour, you can participate. But the, 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 the fact of the matter is that under the present system, black men in this country don't come up to those standards by the government's measure. Well, certainly there are fewer of them than there are white people. Is Mr Smith a racist? He is, of course. Clear racist. I mean, he makes no apology about that. He's a racist. How does he express that to you, or how do you think that is made clear by his actions? Well, when, by, 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 by. Uh, first, his party, the policy of his party is racist. They believe in, 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 in white and black. And once uh, a party and the leaders of a party uh, expresses their, their view in terms of, of white, in terms of, of black, then those people are racist. Can you ever accept that? Perhaps black majority rule will be better done if it's done slowly, that the history of independent black Africa has not been a happy one. No, no, we're not talking about race here. We're talking about a people making, uh, uh, getting the right to decide their future. And uh, to say that it should come slowly, one, uh, it would mean that uh, people believe that the Africans in this country are, are not as human or in equal human beings as the white people. So why does it come slowly? We are saying the population of this country, not just the blacks, the population of this country together must make decisions. And that's what we are saying. As for the history of Africa, well, let us look back to the history of Europe. Is it, is it as glamorous as that? The point of... It is not. The point I was trying to make, sir, though, was that would not the Africans develop better economically if the white man continues to stay here and who hold says, economic who power. Who says the white man must go? We are saying, we are not looking at people as white. Your colour to me makes no difference. You are just a human being. Uh, what we are saying is that the people of this country together must make decisions. Why should the white people leave? If they leave, it will be on their own 
you know, decision, no, not because the Africans want them to go. But the sad history is that they will leave, won't they? Oh, if, if they leave, we say goodbye, we'll be sorry to lose them, but we'll do our job here. And will, will your people be better for that? The, the, our people, like any other people, have got to carry themselves up with their shoestrings, and that's all they do. it. I hope I'm not appearing boastful when I say to you, we've created a high standard of civilization here. We have actually given our black people more than, for example, the British gave any black people in countries to the north of us that they colonized. Our black people have a higher standard of living, they have better education facilities, they have better health facilities than any of the countries to the north of us. This is the difference and it's a very big difference. I'm sure, sir, there are many people who realize that having visited this country, but who still say it doesn't really matter much these days. Black men must run, must run black men's countries, even if they make a mess of them. Well, I again say I've heard that said before. I disagree with it, though. I don't think people should run countries for the worse and make a mess of it. And the second point I make to you is if it was only a black man's country, perhaps that would be an argument. But you see, it isn't. This is a country for both black men and white men. And that is the difference as far as religion is concerned. This is a unique case in the whole of Africa. And I think we must judge it accordingly. We have held our own against terrorist incursions for quite a few years. I think uh, we have proved our ability to contain terrorism. And, and I think I'm using a mild word. We've got on top of terrorism, we have inflicted severe penalties on the terrorists who've come into our country, and I'm satisfied that we can continue to do that. In fact, I believe our ability to deal with terrorists is improving the whole time. If, though, the terrorist activity becomes more than simply border incursions and heavy armour starts to be used, as it was in Angola, would you then have to review the situation? This would create a new problem. It would be silly of us to deny this. If we got mixed up with people who were using sophisticated weapons and they had the people behind the weapons with the know-how to employ those weapons, then I think in all honesty we must concede that uh, the picture would change. But I do say to you that we have got fairly sophisticated weapons ourselves here and uh, we can go quite a long way further than we have had to go so far. Could you hope for help from South Africa in the event of a great increase in terrorist activity? Well, uh, this is something which is constantly under review and consideration. And I believe it is something that we will have to assess and judge when the time comes. I believe the South African government would wish to consider it on the evidence at that time. That's not as confident a an answer, sir, with respect to some of the answers you've just given me. Well, I'm a pragmatic sort of person and I don't like getting my head up into the clouds, and I think this is the down-to-earth answer. Prime Minister, since we last talked to you, have had a change of government in Australia, and I'm wondering what your reaction and the reaction of your government was to that. Well, I don't like interfering in other people's affairs, you know. I've got enough to do with trying to solve my own problems. However, I can say this to you. It would be hypocritical of me to say anything else, that we were very pleased with this change because the previous Prime Minister went out of his way to be obnoxious to Rhodesia, to try to interfere in our affairs, and it was uncalled for. He hurled insults at me and my government. I never even bothered to reply to him. I think it's an unfortunate situation where you get the leaders of government hurling verbal insults at one another. I would say to you that the last Labour Party government brought Australia's fair name into a certain amount of disrepute. And for that reason, I believe you are well rid of them. But in addition, I would say that we are basically conservatives and you have moved more to the conservative side. So, again, for that reason, we think it was a good move. Prime Minister, thank you very much for talking to Four Corners. Thank you. At the Salisbury Sports Club, a friendly cricket match is part of Rhodesia's shared inheritance with those countries who were once part of an empire on which the sun never set. For some Rhodesians, there's almost a dreamlike quality to life, which obscures the fact that this is a country at the centre of the world's most significant political developments.
Less than a hundred miles from here, Rhodesian soldiers are engaged in a deadly struggle with armed revolutionaries who equate the colonial inheritance with exploitation and suppression. It's not that white Rhodesians aren't aware of that struggle. It's just that many of them have a blind confidence that their traditional domination of the black community is not under any threat. The rest of the world seems to think the pressure is really on now. With the fall of Angola, that the pressure is on, that there will have to be some kind of political compromise here soon. Do you think that's true? There has to be something within the next 20 years, but uh, not within the next 20 years, as I say. I can't see it myself. What about you? What, what time span would you give it? I'm not prepared to give any time span. What I would say is that the nation itself, as Rhodesians, um, we're prepared for the ultimate and that I think that if the fight had to be, if it had to come to the crunch that the guys in Rhodesia itself would stand for that punch and it would take a lot longer than people would imagine it would take. I'm a South African and um, I believe that um, the time span is probably less than two years but that there's so much goodwill between the major body of Africans and whites in this country that we can work it out together without the help of the rest of the world. I think what you're doing actually is you're discrediting the Rhodesian because the Rhodesian is a, is a, is a nation that has fought for itself for time immemorial and um, it will continue to do so and we feel for our country like most people do feel for their country if they've got any honest opinion of their country, if they really feel for it you, they you, will fight you, put for much, with you. you put a much shorter time. I think time. there will be a compromise what in that of, short space of time. What sort of compromise will it be, do you think? Uh, probably at least parity between blacks and whites in Parliament. And why do you see that? Why do you think... Certainly you've put a much quicker time span on it than most people here. Why because do you of think the, that's because of the economic pressures on this country. I think that is the main factor. You know what, we've... we've, we've honestly, we've survived for 10, nearly 11 years like this. Admittedly, the Angolan problem has arisen so fast that we haven't been able to cope with it. But I think that the Rhodesian has enough guts, quite honestly, to last out this sort of pressure because we have fought for, what's the terrorist war gone on for? For 10 years? Least, and we've no, fought no, no. terrorists. You're not fighting terrorists anymore, you're fighting communists, and really that's a completely different ball game. What, if, we, if we unify, if the country is prepared to unify and really get together, admittedly we can't last forever without, without exterior support. But at it's the moment... Support, yeah. But no, without exterior even... support, or right, admittedly our time is limited, but I honestly feel that for the protection of the Western world. The Western world realizes the danger involved at the moment and I can't honestly believe that we'd be left alone for that period of time. Finally though, does it matter much what you feel? There are six million, seven million of them, a quarter of a million of you. If it finally comes to numbers and the battle, can you stand out much longer? Could I ask you that first? Against them? Yes. themselves personally definitely without a doubt it's outside world is a different sort of thing if though they start to be supported by outside forces as the Angolan situation proved what then be, be very tricky very tough. Very I don't tricky really believe tough. that I, can honestly, you depend on many friends then in the world not many <laughs> but until, we'll until the time comes no one knows Wait. to see the Rhodesian problem in terms of black and white majority versus minority, good versus evil, is the easiest way to judge the moral issues. But the problem is more complicated than that. In this cricket team, there's at least one doctor who prefers to work in a black hospital in Salisbury for about a quarter of the income he'd make if he went into private practice dealing exclusively with white patients. Call it paternalism, describe it as the solving of a guilty conscience, the fact is that many white Rhodesians want only to live in peace with their black neighbours and to see them advance economically and politically as fast as possible. The tragedy is that in Rhodesia today, there's no longer any place for the voices of moderation.